Kids, kids, right? You know how kids are. Everywhere you take them, they're like, what's that? Well, why is this here? How did that come to be the way it is? Right? Everywhere. And uh, for the past 20 years, I've been studying the terrestrial ecosystems of Antarctica, basically asking and answering those very same questions. And tonight, I want to talk to you about how curiosity-driven basic research is shining a light on and allowing us to understand and address existential problems like climate change. But it's also telling us something about biomedicine and biological breakthroughs in human medicine and also about the possibility of even finding life outside of Earth and outside of our solar system. So... uh, Yeah, this is a high-def, high-resolution image of uh, what it's like in Antarctica. (laughs) Yeah, Antarctica is the highest, the driest, the windiest, and the coldest continent on planet Earth. And um, most of it looks like that. About 98% of the continent is covered by a huge ice sheet. Uh, And that ice sheet is, on average, about two miles thick. You have to drill down through two miles of ice before you actually get to the dirt that's underneath that. So my friends and I always joke about how the ski report at the South Pole is like two miles pack, two inches powder, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's a, it's, it's a continent. So unlike the North Pole, you've got an ocean that's over the North Pole. The South Pole, you've got a continent that's down there, and it's a big continent. In this image, superimposed a map of the United States on top of the continent of Antarctica, so you can see how big that continent is. It, that continent's bigger than the United States, and across that continent runs a large mountain chain called the Transantarctic Mountains. And the Transantarctic Mountains prevent that ice cap from coming over the other side of the mountains. And so on the leeward side of the mountains, you've got these vast ice-free areas uh, that are like large polar deserts. And that's where I do most of my research. In fact, my curiosity has taken me throughout the Transantarctic Mountains. In fact, in this place, in northern Victoria land, about froze my fingers off trying to study soil ecosystems using sterile techniques. <laughs> and then way down here closer to the South Pole, I actually fell into a crevasse one time trying to get from a glacier to the soils that I was trying to sample. Now that was messed up. Um, but most of the research that I do takes place here in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. The McMurdo Dry Valleys are the largest ice-free area of Antarctica and also home of the long-term ecological research program, a group that I work with. And so uh, in this picture, you can see what my crib looks like, where I usually live when I'm down there. So you can see my, (coughs) you can see my tent and you can see my backpack, (coughs) excuse me, and you can see my sleep kit there. I might need a drink of water. (laughs) Actually, you don't want to drink that. Uh, That's not a water bottle. looks like one. Um, That's a pee bottle. Right? Because when you're doing research in the most pristine environment in the world, you can't just go behind a rock and take a whiz because you're going to ruin somebody else's research who comes by along later. Right? You have to think about it. Like, this is the most pristine ecosystems on planet Earth. They have never been jacked up by humans before. There are no indigenous Antarcticans who lived there for thousands of years going around moving things around and burning stuff down and pooping and peeing on stuff. Uh, There have been no direct impacts by humans on this part of the planet ever until now where humans thousands of miles away now by burning fossil fuels and emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere are changing atmospheric conditions which are then changing climate conditions which are now starting to have impacts on these ecosystems. So they're terrific places for us to try and understand how climate change is affecting Earth's ecosystems in the absence of other human interventions. Yeah, so this is what prime real estate in the McMurdo Dry Valleys looks like. Really nice, right? Uh, you'll notice a lack of things like grass and trees, birds, bugs, beetles, squirrels, mosquitoes. No mosquitoes down there. Um, most of the life that exists there lives on the soils and in the ephemeral melt streams and in the permanently ice-covered lakes that are there. And uh, remember that life here is limited by the presence of liquid water. 
And most of the time, the water down there is locked up in a solid state, right? Ice. But for a few weeks out of the year, that ice will melt. It gets warm enough that ice will change state from a solid to a liquid, and then life happens. And uh, at this point, you're saying, like, all right, cool, man. What kind of animals live down here? And, right, you've all watched those nature shows on PBS. Animal biodiversity and wildlife consists of a bunch of penguins, you know, maybe some seals, some killer whales. Those are all super cool animals. But they're marine animals. They live in the ocean. Those shows aren't showing you the totally awesome charismatic megafauna of terrestrial Antarctica. Right? And so you want to know what those animals are, right? Those animals got to be super tough. Those animals got to be able to be freeze-dried to a crisp and then reanimate when they get liquid water again or frozen in a block of ice and then come alive again once they thaw out. Super tough animals. Tough animals like this. Tardigrades, right? Or rotifers or nematode worms. All these animals are super tough. You've heard about tardigrades being super tough before, right? These are the animals that scientists took up into the International Space Station, and then they pushed them outside and exposed them to radiation and the vacuum of space and crazy swings in temperature. And then they brought them back to Earth, added water to them, came back alive, right? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And, and rotifers and nematode worms, these are some animals that have been recovered from Siberian permafrost that's 20,000 years old. And you bring it into the lab and you can revive these animals from that. Right? They come back alive. Totally awesome. So when I go out and collect my samples from that prime real estate in the McMurdo Dry Valleys and I put them under my microscope, <laughs> right? Right? Like, how cool is that? To see these animals that have been in suspended animation for who knows how long come alive right underneath your microscope. That's awesome. <laughs> but in addition to being super cool and beautiful and awesome, these animals are also teaching us something about how terrestrial ecosystems are responding to climate-driven changes. For example, my colleagues and I have done some experiments where we show that some parts of Antarctica, in response to warming, are actually probably going to get harsher. They're going to get drier and be less suitable for life, be more like Mars even. But other parts of Antarctica where it's warming are becoming wetter. And where it gets wetter and warmer, the animals that have adapted to live in those environments now are starting to expand their distributions and their abundance across the landscape. And those other animals that are adapted to the colder and drier and saltier parts of the soils in Antarctica, their abundance and distributions are starting to decrease across the landscape. Yeah. And, and another experiment that we're really interested in, a natural experiment, has to do with these lakes, these permanently ice-covered lakes. These lakes are closed basin lakes. So they're like bathtubs that don't have a drain in them. And as the climate warms, the glaciers are melting and those streams are filling these lakes and the lake levels are rising. So my colleagues and I are really interested in understanding the process by which dry land is subsumed by water and terrestrial ecosystems are converted into aquatic ecosystems. Right? At this point, you're like, eh, whatever. Well, think about it. Uh, that's kind of a big deal given our future and the rate at which uh, ocean levels, sea levels are rising. Right? So understanding fundamental principles about those concepts are going to be really important. This is a picture of a site deep in the Transantarctic Mountains where my colleagues and I collected some soil samples that are the first that we know of ever found on planet Earth that don't have life in it. Like, despite the fact that these soils have been exposed to the atmosphere for millions of years, life has not yet found a way to live there. And this uh, finding uh, illuminates our ability to identify the boundaries of life here on earth, but it also allows us and informs our speculations about our ability to find life elsewhere in the solar system and in the universe. Pretty cool, right? Oh yeah, and remember those worms I was telling you about? Dry them to a crisp, just add water, they come back alive. Yeah, I've got some colleagues who sort of borrowed that trick, applied it to biomedicine, and made freeze-dried blood. Yeah, for humans. It's a thing. That, it's just not science fiction. That's, it's a thing. It's legit. 
And also consider this, like uh, when a human heart is taken out of one person to be given to a recipient, that heart's good for about five hours and that's it. But imagine if we could take that trick that that little nematode worm uses to be frozen in a block of ice and then come back alive again. If we could apply that trick to these human organs, yeah, we could just freeze them and keep them on the shelf until we've got a recipient that's ready for them. Like how many human lives could we save with that trick? Pretty cool, right? All right. So up until now, I've been blathering on about uh, how basic curiosity-driven research can allow us to understand and solve big existential problems like climate change. And it's providing these biomedical breakthroughs and it's telling something about the likelihood of finding life (laughs) outside of our planet. But now I wanna leave you with four important challenges that are related to this. And the first one has to do with extinction. Currently, and this is a conservative estimate, about 25 species go extinct every day. Right, And when they go, they take with them not just how beautiful they are or their contributions to ecosystem structure and functioning, but imagine this. If I wanted to take some cells from a human or some tissues or organs or maybe even the whole person and put them into suspended animation and at some point in the future, like, revive them again, what if the trick to doing that is locked up in the genomic architecture of some obscure nematode worm somewhere that like unfortunately just went extinct with 24 other animals today. Uh, That's messed up. Like what a missed opportunity, right? Let's not do that anymore, okay? Um, The second thing I wanna talk about has to do with financing science. There's no company out there that's gonna pay me millions of dollars over two decades to study worms in Antarctica, right? (laughs) <laughs> That's never going to happen because you can't monetize it. You can't figure out what the balance is, what the return of investment is on that until you've actually done it. Yeah, exploratory research like this, it's like support for education or public support for the arts, right? The investments in basic curiosity-driven scientific research is probably one of the most hopeful things that we as humans do. The third thing, All kids are brought into this world with an innate sense of curiosity, a sense of wonder and awe. And then as they start to grow up, we we adults just kind of beat it out of them. Yeah, that's messed up too, right? (laughs) Because that generation needs that curiosity in order to ask the questions and in order to solve the problems that we have for them. Let's nurture that curiosity in all of our kids and in our in our friends and everyone, right? That's the, that's, that's the start to the solution to the problem. And then lastly, let's empower our teachers. Let's give our teachers the support they need to provide our kids with what they need to answer the questions that their curiosity is driving. That's the greatest hope that we have for a better future. Thank you. Thank you.